All right, let's get started. Thanks everyone for coming. Today we'll be talking about Apache Hadoop 3's current status. So first, a bit about ourselves. My name is Andrew Wong. I work on HTTPS at Cloudera. I'm a Hadoop PMC member. I'm also the release manager for Hadoop 3. Joining me today is Jinping Du. He works at, on Yarn at Hortonworks. He's a, Horton, uh, he's a Hadoop PMC member and is a release manager for the Hadoop 2.8 line. Let's start by talking about the motivation for, or about the abbreviated history of Hadoop releases. So going back to the very first release at the ASF, it was 0.14.1 in 2007. Um, Hadoop was actually created at Yahoo by Doug Cutting in 2006, but this was our first release at the ASF. 1.0 was our first major release that had a number of significant features in it, notably security and H-based support, and that was released in 2011. Hadoop 2 followed shortly afterwards in 2012, adding another set of really major features, things like uh, Yarn, Name Node HA, and wire compatibility. And then we had a succession of different 2.x releases, uh, 2006 and 2007 and 2014 and 2015, adding features like HTTPS encryption, rolling upgrade, Yarn node labels, and uh, 2.7 is actually our most recent production quality release line, again, released in 2015. So looking at that, you might ask, why Hadoop 3? We've been on Hadoop 2 for a long time, and adding all these high-impact features. What's the motivation for a new major release? After all, we've only had, um, up till now, two major releases in Hadoop's 10-year history. Well, there are a number of different reasons. The first was upgrading the minimum required Java version from Java 7 to Java 8. This is because Oracle end of life to public updates for Java 7 in April 2015, which means that many libraries in the Java ecosystem have stopped supporting Java 7 entirely and require Java 8. So we felt it was time for uh, Hadoop to also move to Java 8 as a result. Um, another reason was HDFS erasure coding. This is a very major feature that we've added in Hadoop 3. Uh, and we decided effectively as a community that it was too big to backport to branch 2. So Hadoop 3 is a good place for it to stabilize uh, this feature. Um, next, we've done substantial improvements to Yarn, making it uh, more friendly for long-running services and running containers. Uh, a bunch of these changes are going to be landing in Hadoop 3. Finally, uh, a bunch of miscellaneous incompatible bug fixes and improvements. Uh, Hadoop 2.x was branched in 2011, meaning that we've had six years of changes waiting for this new major release. So what's the current status of Hadoop 3? So the plan was to do a series of alpha and beta releases leading up to an eventual GA later this year. The idea here is that we have time to stabilize during the alpha and beta release process. These also serve as good artifacts for the community to focus their testing efforts. So far, we've already released three alphas, and alpha 4 is planned for uh, very shortly from now, and it's planned to be the last alpha, essentially our feature freeze. That'll be followed by beta one later this year, which will be our compatibility freeze. And the plan is to GA sometime in Q4 this year. You can look at this wiki page for the latest updates on uh, the plan for Hadoop 3. Uh, let's jump into the new features that are coming in HGFS and Hadoop. We'll follow that um, later on with features that are coming in Yarn and MapReduce. So I alluded to this already uh, in the earlier slides, but the big new feature is HGFS erasure coding. I'll talk about the motivation for erasure coding. Right now in HDFS, HDFS provides durability for its data by replicating all blocks three times. So here in our example, we have this foo.csv file, which is a three-block file. Because each block is replicated three times, it means we have nine total replicas, three times three. What this means, though, is that we have 200% overhead to maintain durability for our data. So even though we only have three logical blocks, we have nine physical blocks when you look at how much data is actually being used across all of your data nodes. So 200% overhead. This is very substantial. Many clusters are, uh, add data nodes, add capacity, purely just for storage reasons. They need to store more data. So if you uh, have some way of reducing this overhead, it could be very, very impactful for the cost for running your cluster. So how does erasure coding do this? Let's go back to our three block file. So rather than replicating these blocks three times, we instead add these two parity blocks, P1 and P2, for our three block file. So our overhead now is greatly reduced. We have five replicas for storing just three blocks, meaning we have just 67% overhead. Compare that again to 200% overhead. With some different schemes, for, especially for larger files, you can do even better. So for uh, this scheme, we have 10 data blocks and four parity blocks. 
uh, you only have a 40% overhead. And remember, 40% overhead compared to the 200% overhead that happens when you use 3x replication. So you can see that erasure coding can have uh, a really big impact on reducing your storage costs for your HDFS clusters. Um, let's dive a little bit more into, again, erasure coding. So the basic idea, again, here is to use these parity blocks in Reed Solomon uh, encoding rather than replication for ensuring data durability. Reed Solomon can be parameterized with these, uh, with K and M, where K is the number of data blocks and M is the number of parity blocks. And HDFS erasure coding supports multiple different Reed Solomon uh, erasure coding policies based on like your cluster topology and your workloads. So we support RS32, RS63, RS104. Uh, which were, we demonstrated some of these on the previous slide. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough even though erasure coding uh, re reduces the storage overhead, it also can potentially improve your storage durability. For 3x replication, if you lose three blocks, all three of your replicas, that data is lost. But with policies like RS63 or RS104, they can actually tolerate three or four failures. So you actually get a win-win in terms of some of these semantics here. You get both improved uh, storage efficiency as well as improved fault tolerance. So the issue coding is very powerful. And I have to mention also the way that Reed Solomon works is that when a block is missing, we reconstruct it from the remaining blocks. So I'll give you an example of that. So let's say we again have our uh, example three block file, which is stored using Reed Solomon 3.2, which means again, three data blocks and two parity blocks. What happens though if we lose one of our data blocks, let's say B3? Well, uh, you can recover B3 by reading the remaining blocks. Because we're using Reed Solomon 3.2 here, that first number tells you how many blocks you need to read to do recovery. And you can read any of the four remaining blocks, any three of the four remaining blocks to do that recovery. So we read those three of those four remaining blocks. We run the Reed Solomon computation to regenerate that uh, block number three, and we had that new copy of block three. This process happens both when uh, at read time by the client, when the client is reading data sort of on demand online, as well as in the background, the name node is instructing data nodes to do recovery for missing blocks in the background. So both the client and the data nodes, like basically the cluster itself, are running Reed Solomon to do uh, reconstruction of missing blocks when you are using erasure-coded files. Uh, of course, this means that recovery is fairly expensive. Um, it's very network intensive. This is because data is striped across multiple different data nodes and also multiple different racks. This means that your I.O. is for the most part remote. You no longer have data locality. You no longer have the ability to use short circuit reads. So that can be impactful for performance for some applications. Um, and again, reconstruction is very network intensive. Whereas before in the replication world, you essentially just read one X amount of data to recover a missing replica. Here you have to read um, up to, uh, actually should be K blocks cross rack, where K is the first number in Reed Solomon. So that's a multiple over the amount that you have to read for recovering in the replication world. Um, so that said, uh, one of the previous issues with erasure coding, which we've actually addressed in HDFS erasure coding, is the network, is, is the CPU overhead. We partnered with Intel uh, when we were developing this feature, and uh, they helped integrate Intel's ISAL library, which provides these optimized uh, native implementations for Reed Solomon. So with these optimized implementations, we were able to go at over a gigabyte a second of raw encode and decode throughput when reading and writing data uh, to HDFS, which is much, much faster than the Java implementation that we were using previously. This means that CPU is no longer a bottleneck for erasure coding in HDFS. And the focus really is on uh, the network overhead, the network impact of doing this cross-rack, cross-data node traffic. Um, one other note about erasure coding, the way we've implemented it in HDFS, is that it really works best when you combine small files together to form large files for erasure coding. If you naively translate your existing replication, replicated files, which might be, let's say, a single block into erasure coding, you end up exploding the block count um, when you turn them into erasure coded files. So what you really want to do is make sure you're generating full blocks for your EC, for your EC files. So for a policy like RS32, you want to make sure you have at least three data blocks. For RS104, you want to make sure you have at least 10 data blocks. So generating these files are perhaps three gigabytes or 10 gigabytes versus the one gigabyte you're using before previously. Um, as a result, because of the overhead of uh, reconstruction and uh, the impact on read performance, as well as the need to write these fairly large files, EC really works best for 
um, archival and cold data use cases. That's not to say that it won't also work for hot data use cases, but that requires perhaps a rethink of your network topology, for instance, a more heavy investment in uh, full bisection bandwidth networks to make erasure coding really work well for your cluster. Let's dive into like, some of the performance numbers we developed with Intel. So on the far left is 3x replication, basically the base case for HGFS right now. The middle two bars are two different Java um, erasure coding implementations, Java reads all implementations. Um, one source from Facebook and one source from Intel. And on the far right is the optimized native ISAL library that Intel provided, which provides acceleration for Reed Solomon using AVX2. And we see that using ISAL, we get excellent performance. We actually get better performance than 3x replication. And the reason for this is because we're actually only writing uh, 1.4x or 1.6x amount of data compared to 3x replication, which writes 3x. So you can actually get better performance by using erasure coding in some situations because you are just operating on less data when you're writing it. Um, next, we did a benchmark where we uh, ran a more realistic workload. Here we are running uh, some Spark TPCH queries on a 500 gigabyte data set. And this is with no data nose kills. We're not running Reed Solomon uh, when, with, with, with the Spark query. And we see that the times are very comparable. Um, the blue bar is erasure coding, the yellow bar is 3x replication. And even though we are reading remote now, we don't have data locality, the performance is still very similar between the, the two bars. This is because for many applications, they're not just reading data, they're also doing computation, they're doing network shuffle. So uh, the potential impact of losing locality only affects the IO bound portions of our Spark query. And I see that for these queries, it's not that big of an impact. Um, so here we're looking at that same set of queries, though, with two data nodes killed. This means that uh, we're forcing the client to do read Solomon computation to recover the data, and also placing much higher demands on the network as a result. So we see that, uh, again, though, EC and application have very comparable performance for Spark. So this is a, great, this is a good sign. So in terms of the SAS of erasure coding, this was a massive effort uh, by the entire Hadoop community. We had something like 20 different contributors from many companies all coming together to work on this feature over the course of three years uh, with hundreds of commits. And I'm happy to say that finally, erasure coding is feature complete. We're still solidifying some uh, final APIs in preparation for beta one, but our current focus is really moving towards making this feature rock solid. We want to make sure that all the different applications in the Apache Hadoop stack work with HGFS erasure coding enabled. And we're also going to be doing a bunch of stress and endurance testing to ensure the stability of the feature uh, when you turn it on in, in your clusters. All right, the next feature I'm going to talk about is class path isolation. So if you ever programmed against the Hadoop APIs, you probably experienced this pain. You might have experienced it with something like Guava, for instance, or Protobuf, or Jackson, or Jetty. There are all these uh, known offender libraries. And basically what's happening here is that when you include the Hadoop client uh, as a dependency for your application, you also pull in all of Hadoop's transit dependencies, which includes all these different libraries that are commonly used uh, by Java applications. This means, though, these Hadoop dependencies can conflict with the dependencies that you yourself are specifying as de direct dependencies for your application. And it means that you can get these inconsistencies in behavior and versions that are very difficult to resolve. And there are many reasons for this. The first, one of the reasons is that there was no separate HGFS client jar. This means that when you were just a client reading and writing the HGFS, we also were pulling in all of the dependencies for the name node and for the data node onto your class path for no really good reason. Um, also, the clients are not shaded. So again, you get all of those Hadoop dependencies, APIs, and jars on your class path, uh, essentially overriding your class path. So address this with a number of different JIRAs I've listed here. The first was splitting out that HGFS client from the HGFS server dependency and making those separate artifacts in Maven. So now you can include a, a slimmed down HGFS client as a user. The next is that we shaded uh, the Hadoop client dependency. This means when you use the shaded client, which we developed in only for Hadoop 3, uh, you only get the Hadoop APIs. All of the other dependencies of that Hadoop pulls in are shaded, so they're hidden from you. This makes it a lot easier for uh, developers to work with different library versions. And the final task, which is still ongoing, is we're looking into shading the task umbilical. So when you're running inside a Yarn container, you potentially get even, even more improved isolation from the node manager's class path. 
And also there are a bunch of miscellaneous uh, changes and improvements in Hadoop 3 I want to just call out real quick. The first is the shell script rewrite. Um, basically, we've totally revamped the way our shell scripts uh, work in Hadoop. So they should be easier to maintain, easier to use. There's documentation on the website. So this is a really great improvement um, spearheaded by one of our uh, operators in the community. The next is support for multiple standby name nodes. This is a feature contributed by Salesforce, which they run in production. Uh, essentially, this gives us enhanced resilience for an HDFS cluster. The current HA deployments in HDFS run two uh, name nodes, so you can tolerate up to one name node failure. Uh, but with multiple standby name nodes, now you can tolerate up to two or three or however many names you're willing to run, you can tolerate more name node failures. So this is important for very business critical uh, Hadoop clusters. The next is the intra-data node balancer. This is a balancer that balances the disks on just a single data node. This is very useful when you're doing things like adding or removing disks to a data node, or if you're running a data node with disks of different sizes. We've also added support for some different cloud storage connectors, namely uh, Microsoft Azure Data Lake ADL and Allian OSS. So these are great improvements if you're running on those clouds. Um, and we've also moved the default ports of many of our services out of the ephemeral range. Um, this is a, a feature that often hits when you're doing rolling upgrades in that previously the default ports of these services uh, will get taken by other applications when you do the restart and they'll fail to come up. We had some stat like 5% of services would just fail to come up when you did a rolling restart. So by moving them to non-ephemeral ports, we have prevented this problem. Um, we also have two ongoing efforts I want to call out. The first is uh, a bunch of S3 consistency and performance improvements that we're doing under the banner of S3 Guard. Um, this is hopefully going to be merged soon and should greatly enhance experience for people who are running on uh, Amazon or using S3. And because we did that work to improve class path isolation, we're going to also try to lock down our Hadoop compatibility policy to provide more useful semantics to our, uh, our, our end user developers and application uh, users. So with that, I'll hand it off to Jinping to talk about Yarn and MapReduce features. Thanks, Andrew. Um, now let me show uh, you guys some uh, magic about Yarn in Hadoop 3. Uh, Mike's not on here. I'm just swap. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. So let me show you some magic about um, uh, Yarn. Um, in Hadoop 3. Um, here is a quick uh, overview. Uh, in, Yon, uh, in Hadoop 3, we, in Yarn part, we support, uh, we provide the native support for our long running services. So previously, uh, Yarn's you know, resource model is more like you know, a batch mode job. You, know, you want to interact with Yarn with kind of um, containers uh, request and, uh, uh, and release mode. But in Yarn, uh, in the Hadoop 3, we provide a native service support. You can just uh, build in your service on top of you know, a common used uh, framework. Um, and also, we, uh, it's, uh, we make Yarn you know, uh, uh, support the Docker. We have a Docker you know, uh, container uh, executor uh, uh, supported in the, in the runtime. And also, we have some bunch of uh, uh, the scheduling uh, enhancements because the Yarn is art, art, is art of uh, our resource scheduling. Uh, also, this bunch of you know um, uh, re, um, large enhancement on the ATS um, um, application timeline service. We call it ATS V2. Uh, it's a large um, enhancement there uh, from the architecture. Um, also, from uh, in Hadoop 3, we have a new um, uh, Yarn uh, UI. That is, uh, uh, we do a lot of enhancement for on, in the perspective not only on the admin but also from the uh, developer sides. Um, there are also other enhancements that we're talking uh, in my um, uh, later. Um, so the first uh, important feature is about uh, native service support for uh, long-running services. So there are a bunch of key uh, you know, drivers uh, behind this feature. Uh, pre uh, previously, uh, you know, the user of Hadoop is always getting a very large cluster. You have a bunch of compute and storage resources, but some are not uh, fully uh, used. So you may, um, even a lot of users may have the questions, you can, Hadoop can you know, run other uh, what kind of uh, workload, or even you can run 
some long running services like HBase, Storm, uh, extra, extra on top of your Hadoop itself, uh, rather than uh, isolated, you know, the several farms. And um, also, uh, you know, Docker is a quite, you know, um, you know, standard population in today's uh, industry. So can Yon can leverage the Docker, uh, the Docker to do some, you know, resource isolation or you know, easy packaging um, the things. Um, yeah, that's all, a lot of you know, drive, uh, the key drivers behind this feature. Uh, so in the Hadoop 3, uh, in the community, we are doing a lot of work to support uh, these features. Uh, the first will provide a, a native uh, Yarn uh, you know, common framework. Uh, instead of you know, every job, the, pr the traditional way of Yarn uh, allocate resource you have, uh, application master to talking with RM to you know, um, specify you know, how much resource you, you, you would like and get container and uh, depends on, you know, de and decide on uh, when to release these containers. That is a traditional way, but now you can um, have, a, you know, uh, a high level API to specify how much resource uh, containers you want and what kind of uh, resource type, uh, container type, and so what topology you are in and how, how long you want this uh, container get running. It's very high level API. Uh, you can easy to building on the uh, services. It's similar to the slide, Apache slider. And the Apache Slider community do a lot of work uh, uh, in a young community as well. Um, and also in scheduling power, you have to, because this, uh, this is a long running service, it's not a uh, you know, batch mode job. And so uh, the lot of you know, uh, scheduling decision have to change uh, or made, like your preemption policy and the reservation policy. You, because this is long running, you have to um, you know, think in, in some other ways. Like, uh, in, like in, for example, in the preemption perspective, you don't, you don't easily want to uh, preempt uh, long running containers because it's uh, maybe a, a, a very quick, uh, you know, mission critical uh, containers uh, there. Also, there are some other, a bunch of enhancement we're doing. You, you need to uh, consider, because it's a long running service or containers that can cross, can run a very long time to cross the versions of this application or services, you have to consider the, uh, the upgrade of these services um, instead of previously um, application only you know, uh, running for one version. And if you want a new version, you can submit a new one, but the long-run services are different. Um, they also, uh, we also provide some you know, common you know, service uh, discovery model because uh, at, the yarn, uh, at the fully yarn uh, services, you need to, you may find some you know, services um, is quite impor uh, important and can be shared. Uh, we, we implemented uh, uh, through the DNS uh, discover, uh, service uh, registry. Uh, That's some uh, details. Also, um, a large uh, uh, enhancement for Yon uh, in uh, Hadoop 3 is uh, we support Docwell on, on this part. So why uh, we have to elaborate with Docker? Because uh, Docker is quite, um, pop, uh, it's quite popular, it provides a lot of benefits. Uh, to um, you know, help to packaging, distributing, and also isolation uh, on these resources. Um, also, um, to support the Docker uh, containers, we can easily, you know, uh, in the yarn, you can easily build uh, the support for the new application, like uh, TensorFlow is an example. You can uh, quickly have uh, you know, yarn application um, or yarn service that can you know deploy the TensorFlow on top of yarn. So I think tomorrow we have a session about some details here. You can uh, you're welcome to join that session to get some details there. Um, so overall, saying uh, when we have a Docker um, containers, it's make your applications focus more on you know top of on the integration rather than uh, you know so the details um, manipulating of the this containers thing. Uh, that's. Uh, um, um, the motivation for uh, elaborating Docker. So, in, so far we in Hadoop 3, we already have some, uh, the make the Docker container get, get running. We have a different uh, uh, runtime uh, execution for Docker uh, container launcher. And for, you know, the, um, the default uh, Linux container uh, running is still uh, keeping there. And we're adding your know, security uh, things to on top of it. And so it's, uh, in, when Hadoop uh, 3, Release it should be including uh, the, all the uh, for, for fully functional uh, Docker support on the uh, Hadoop suite. Um, yeah, via through the Docker, we can achieve you know like I previously mentioned, we can achieve a, a lot of new apps on top of Yarn. Uh, we can even you know run Yarn on top of Yarn itself, you know using Yarn to you know testing Hadoop uh, and other stuff. Actually, internally we are actually using Yarn as an infrastructure resource. Um, to manage your resource and to testing the, the, all the, the things uh, related to Hadoop. 
Um, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, so the yarn itself is about uh, the art of uh, uh, resource scheduling. So we had uh, a lot of you know, scheduling enhancements. Uh, the first one, we uh, provide a generic resource type because previously we, has, you know, we only have a memory resource and later on we're adding CPU resource. But you know, eventually we're adding more and more like to support uh, the deep learning workloads. We needed some GPU uh, uh, isol uh, isolation and scheduling things. And also we need to, uh, you know, networking and disk IO, uh, you know, scheduling. Um, and, you know, so here in Hadoop 3, we are providing a generic, um, you know, resource type. Uh, we call it a resource profile. So you can, um, in, in your containers, uh, you can, uh, in your application, you can just specify this, um, um, this uh, your resource in the combination of, uh, you know, uh, many kinds of uh, resources. It's just like, a, uh, the concept is a bit like a EC2 instance, so you can, you can allocate it at virtual, some, some virtual level resources, some, you know, you, you can even add new resource type uh, later on. Uh, you don't have to each, you know, adding uh, one resource uh, one by one. And also the global scheduling is uh, quite important because previously uh, the Yarn scheduling model is uh, node manager talking uh, with a resource man manager. Uh, each heart beating is a uh, time for triggering a uh, uh, resource scheduling. But we found this, uh, this way is a bit um, uh, low performance that's uh, because you only have a single thread to, um, uh, to allocate in the containers. Also, the, another side effect is uh, you, this, this is more like a greedy algorithm you know, to, uh, to allocate resource because only uh, one, uh, only one um, uh, node manager coming, uh, resource coming available will decide uh, which, uh, uh, which um, request to feed in. So now with the global schedule, you can have a, you know, more global view on you know, how many resources are still pending, how many uh, resources are available. So we'll have a better decision on you know, uh, when and you know, where to schedule these uh, uh, containers. There are other bunch of you know, capacity scheduler improvements. Like uh, one important is the queue management improvements about the capacity scheduler. Previously, uh, you only, the only way you uh, change this uh, queue resource, you have to go through uh, the configuration of uh, the capacity scheduler, uh, you change there and you do the refresh queue, it works. But now you can s using uh, REST API uh, to accessing um, this, queue uh, uh, this queue management stuff. So you can, uh, this queue, the yarn resource can be uh, easily, more easily to integrate on this with uh, third party software and you know, scripts. And also they support more you know, operations on the queue. Previously we don't support delete queue, rename queue stuff, um, so now it's get, you are getting supported. So this part work is still going on in the community. Um, I, I, it's, uh, I think the over, it's a, a linking effort joined with the Hortonworks on, on this part. Um, also we have uh, other uh, enhancement like, uh, uh, you know, priority support in application and, and the queue level. Uh, like you, when you want to preempt uh, the resource from, you know which, you know, what kind of uh, priority for current application and queue, and you know how, you know, preempt this queue uh, from. Um, and also there's some, you know, uh, preemption improvements in both, you know, capacity scheduler and uh, fair scheduler. So um, uh, this, this uh, for, uh, you know, due to the time uh, restraint, we don't go to this kind of details. Uh, you can finds on the community jurors. Um, so um, another quite important for Hadoop 3 is we have a new, um, you know, time, a brand new uh, timeline service. So the previously the timeline service, um, so overall, uh, overall um, the timeline service for Yarn is quite important because uh, that's an important way you can understanding your Yarn application uh, get running. Uh, we are the big data platform, but the first thing you have to analysis on understanding your data about your uh, application. So for, for, for the first version of the ATS, uh, the amount of uh, design bottlenecks, uh, we have a single point failure because we are, uh, we are using a single node uh, uh, application timeline server. That is the backend is uh, actually level DB based or rolling level B, uh, DB based, which is, uh, has a you know, significant um, bottleneck on the performance and you know and uh, uh, availability, but the V2 we have a large improvements. We 
we make it the whole architecture fully distributed. Um, and also we make um, uh, well, the backend, uh, instead of the single node uh, level DB or rolling level DB, we're using edge base uh, backend, which is a very uh, scalable um, you know, backend storage. And also we have uh, enhanced the data model, uh, like we provide the first class citizen for floor, concept of floor and, and config. The floor is quite important because previously Yuan can only understand in the things in the job level. But now, but actually in the reality of the, the world actually, uh, the many, many com complicated job uh, you have to go through uh, you know, a bunch of uh, yarn jobs. Just like a complicated uh, hive uh, query, you go through a yarn, you will you know, divide into different um, MapReduce or you know, taste jobs. So um, yarn, previously yarn doesn't understand all these concepts, but now you understand the flow, uh, you can do the, uh, the proper aggregation on this kind of uh, the matrix or the, the necessary information. Um, this is architecture enhancement from this architecture. You can see uh, this no single point failure here. So all, you know, for each application, we'll have a timeline collector uh, to, uh, to collect the, um, the, uh, mach uh, the information from each application. So that your, no matter your container or the node manager uh, related uh, matrix uh, get a send, you, you only send to, you know, a per app uh, uh, collector. If your app collector is getting uh, crashed and uh, not affecting other applications. Uh, this is writer pass and the reader pass is all the same uh, because backend is uh, edge based, so you, it's just the edge based client. You, you can uh, read anywhere uh, unless, um, so that's fully uh, distributed. This is also Yarn uh, brand new web UI. So previously, the Yarn UI is more like an admin perspective. It's, you can see the resource um, and, and, and things going on in the, in the cluster level or in the system level. But actually, in the um, Hadoop 3, the Yarn new UI, you, will, you, will, you, will, you can dig into uh, more details about how uh, your application is uh, going on and or how your, um, the queue uh, is going on, uh, like how many applications within uh, it can occupy the different uh, uh, resource share stuff. And also, you can even uh, dig into your application to see you know, your containers assign which kind of uh, contain, uh, you know, node managers you can dig in all these details from the new, uh, brand new UI. And also you can see the heat map of the node managers. Um, so you can know if, if your scheduler has some problems, uh, you can through this, uh, this, uh, this UI so you can find, uh, easily find these um, uh, problems. There's also some, you know, MISC, um, you know, YARN and MR uh, improvements like opportunistic uh, containers. Um, so, so previously, the young containers uh, is always like um, I claim uh, the maximum the result I could be used, but actually I may not use in the uh, get launch. I may not using all this resource uh, in the totally uh, life cycle of the containers. So in that case, the node manager itself uh, may found uh, the still vacant resource even from the young perspective or resource manager perspective. If this node manager is is booked. But actually, there's still some free resources in the in the uh, actually running time. Uh, Optimistic containers is uh, is for this case. You can run some low level containers uh, in case there's still system you know uh, resource um, free. But when the other a regular container or we call it a guarantee container gets uh, want to get back these uh, these resources, so this low. Um, uh, this low priority containers can be, you know, preempted or released. Uh, there are also some other features like a young federation to this uh, provide a way to, uh, you know, support up to, you know, uh, 100k uh, nodes um, and beyond. And also some HA improvement there for, you know, in our really uh, our practice is a bunch of uh, network issues will be affected. So I'm um, HA because I'm a state store connection to the ZK uh, Zookeeper store is kind of uh, uh, is quite uh, it can be unstable, and uh, for MapReduce is some native uh, um, uh, service. Um, it's, it's it's a native uh, uh, replacement from the the previous uh, uh, component uh, work. This work is go, uh, I think it's done in Hadoop three as well, and and using uh, that feature can you know can enhance your uh, performance to you know twenty to thirty percent in some you know very shuffle intensive jobs. 
Okay, so a quick summary on the, um, on the Hadoop 3 uh, new thing features. So first is storage optim optimization. We support um, HDFI UH coding, and we, uh, to improve the utilization of the Hadoops, uh, we, are we have a support for YON uh, long running services and the Docker containers. And we also have additional, uh, you know, to support uh, new um, workloads, we have the Docker, um, you know, and uh, isolation uh, support. Uh, we also have a new UI to, um, to, to, you know, for better user experience. So, yeah, so I'll hand over to um, uh, Andrew for some quick summaries. Oh. So to close out, let's talk about compatibility and testing. Uh, so one of the very first things we did before we embarked on this Hadoop 3 journey is talk to all the large users in the Hadoop community about what they needed from a new major release. The number one thing they asked for was preserving compatibility with Hadoop 2 clients and also preserving rolling upgrade. Wire compatibility with Hadoop 2 clients is very important because it's essentially impossible to coordinate the upgrade of a cluster with all of its off cluster clients. Uh, so we preserve compatibility with Hadoop 2 clients with Hadoop 3 servers. Rolling upgrade similarly is very important when you have a situation where you can't take downtime for a business critical cluster. We didn't see a need to break rolling upgrade, so we decided let's keep it between Hadoop 2 to Hadoop 3. But even though we are preserving wire compatibility and preserving rolling upgrade, Keep in mind we're not fully preserving API compatibility. It means you can't just swap out your Hadoop 2 jars with Hadoop 3 jars and expect your application to recompile and work transparently. We are still doing things like bumping our dependency versions, removing some deprecated APIs and tools. The shell script rewrite does impose some changes as well, and also some incompatible bug fixes. Uh, but it does mean, though, you can keep on using your Hadoop 2 client to talk to your Hadoop 3 cluster. So testing and validation, um, this again, this extended alpha, beta to GA release plan was designed to help stabilize the Hadoop 3 release. Uh, happily, it has worked in that EC actually has already uh, been picked up by some users in production. There's a 700 node cluster running at Yahoo Japan, and they've overall been very happy with the quality of Hadoop 3 thus far. Caldera is also rebasing uh, CDH against upstream trunk and running its full integration test suite uh, against basically trunk. So that same code that's used to validate CDH is being used to validate uh, Hadoop 3. And Cloudera is also putting efforts into integrating Hadoop 3 with all the different components in the Hadoop 3 stack, basically making sure things like Hive and Spark and Solar and so on all compile and work against Hadoop 3. Hortonworks, of course, is also doing um, uh, some testing and integration efforts with Hadoop 3. And there are plans from Cloudera and Intel to do extensive testing for HFS erasure coding to make sure the feature is really stable. Uh, happily, there's also this nice synergy between the 2.8 line that Joomping is the release manager for and the Hadoop 3 line, which I'm the release, man I'm the release manager for, in that they share much of the same code, except for erasure coding. So Yahoo is doing scale testing for 2.8 right now, and many of the fixes that, are going, uh, that Yahoo are, is finding for 2.8 also apply to Hadoop 3. So it's a nice synergy between the two release in, releases in terms of finding and fixing issues. And in conclusion, um, we have all these shiny new features that are coming in Hadoop 3. Uh, we expect Hadoop 3 GA to be sometime uh, at the end of the year. And that makes now a great time to get more involved if you as a user are interested in any of these new features. So please feel free to reach out to any of us or on the user, user or dev list if you're interested in trying out Hadoop 3. And if you're interested in talking to the Hadoop developers, uh, we're also having these two BOFs on Thursday after the conference at 5 p.m. And we have the rooms for uh, the Yarn HS BOFs on the screen here. Thank you very much.